Avinu, our Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gifting of the Ruach HaKodesh to every one of us who are yours. Because he takes his abode within each of our bodies, Lord, because we're his temple. Lord, so many things you have blessed us with. We could say, Dayenu. It would have been enough if, but Lord, you have blessed us with these spiritual gifts in our body, Lord. And we're all called to be ministers in that body because it's your body. Lord, some of us are called with different callings that are in the public, that are seen. But then some of us are called with callings that are in the background, every bit, if not more, necessary than the ones who are seen. So we give you the glory and the honor because it's you who distributes to each one of us as you desire. And if some of, uh, some of us receive more gifts than others, Lord, we just say, Baruch Hashem, bless your name, Lord, because you've brought them within our body to minister to brothers and sisters, to minister outside. Lord, there's a poem once that said, Messiah has no hands but ours and no feet but ours to be able to minister to the world. So you've called us to do that because we're your body. So empower us to be able to do that, but more so, Lord, change our heart, O oh Lord, to make us receptive to hear when you deber, when you speak to us. And Lord, sometimes maybe we need to take a little bit of time and go bar in the wilderness so we can get our heart right to hear you. Lord, work in each one of our hearts to make us greater servants so that one day when we come before you, you will say to us, well done, great and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your master. So Lord, we look forward to that time. We look forward to those words. Lord, empower me to speak your words today to your people. I pray in the name of Yeshua and all God's people said, Amen. Last week, I began to teach on major turning points, and we're going to get back to church history again next Shabbat. But major turning points in the church after the life and death and resurrection of our Messiah. By the way, uh, I should have put quote marks because the rest of my teaching so far in church history has quote marks around the word church, which I did explain in the very first Shabbat that I was doing this church history thing, that that word was not even in existence in the first century. So... We are, with that understanding, even if I don't put the quote mark around it, realize that the quote marks are really there and that we're talking about a progressive thing that has happened throughout the body of Messiah, which is now called the church, that are major turning points. Now, I'm not going to be hitting, as I've said over and over again, I'm not going to hit on every single thing of history. Otherwise, these last 2,000 years, it's going to take that long to go through it all ain't going to happen. So what I'm going to be doing is touching on major turning points because there are major turning points in the body of Messiah that have taken it away from where it used to be in the first century. We saw that in Acts chapter 21 where the church, as it is now called, was once a Jewish organization. Acts 21. And that Torah was zealously pursued. Acts chapter 21. If you look at the church today, it's not predominantly Jewish. And overall, Torah is irrelevant. As some would say, Torah was nailed to the cross and is no longer applicable in the life of a believer. So what we need to understand is there are major turning points, and we'll get back to that subject again next week. However, the most immediate and most powerful one was that which we were reading about just moments ago in Acts chapter 2. And that is the Feast of Shavuot, or Pentecost, which happens tonight at sundown. Now, this feast in the year 30, when Yeshua was crucified and killed and resurrected, uh, this feast happened on a specific day of the week. Uh, it doesn't always fall. If you're going to follow after the pharisaical count, which we do, uh, it doesn't always fall from Saturday night to Sunday night. But what we're going to see, and I talked about remezim or patterns or hinting uh, just a few moments ago, looking at a pattern and seeing it happen over and over again, in this case of Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks, we could see that 
On the same day of the year, 1,500 years earlier, Torah was received on Mount Sinai. So if you went with me to Exodus chapter 19, you're going to see here we were, after we leave Egypt, Mitzrayim, we see that we are gathered at Mount Sinai, and there we receive the Torah. It says in Exodus 19.1, in the third month, or within the third month after the people of Israel had left the land of Egypt, the same day they came to the Sinai Desert. Here's where God says in verse number five, if you pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you will be a kingdom of Kohanim for me, a nation set apart or sanctified. These are the words that you are to speak to the people of Israel. So these words were given to us on the mountain. There on the mountain, verse number 9, was the thick cloud. There on the mountain, the people were commanded, don't even touch this mountain. Wash your clothes, get ready for tomorrow. I'm going to come down on Mount Sinai before the eyes of the people. On the mountain, God had so far blasts and lightning, verse 16, and thick clouds and thunder. What we see here is a covenant that God is making with the people. Verse 18, Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke and the Lord descended onto it in fire. Verse number 19, at the sound of the shofar, as it grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke and God answered him with a voice. In this case, the people heard what? The people heard thunder. The people heard the shofar. And the people were afraid. They said to Moses, you go up. You talk to God. But it was God on this mountain, on Shavuot, that was marrying Israel. He didn't just marry Moses. Now, why do I say that? Well, look at Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, depending on your, if you're in the Christian Bible or the Jewish Bible, it's either verse 30 or 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, I will make a brit hadashah, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. One thing to mention here, if you're not a part of the house of Israel and you're not a part of the house of Judah, you're not a part of the new covenant. You might as well go back to Ephesians chapter 2, what Paul was saying about you Gentiles. You were lost. You had no hope. You had no God. So if you're not a part of Israel, and Israel consists of all the tribes, all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also, as we've talked about earlier, the sojourners from the nations. This is key. This is important for us to understand this feast. And the house of Judah, that means from the Jews. There's a specific tribe here. If you're not descended from Judah in some way, shape, or form, you are not Jewish, spiritual or otherwise. But you are Israel. So if you're going to be sharing somebody with anybody, just say, I'm of Israel. Because you are just as much as Caleb. Caleb was not Jewish. He wasn't even descended from Abraham physically. He was a Kenizzite because his father, Sephune, was a Kenizzite who attached himself as a sojourner or a foreigner to the tribe of Judah. And he did receive. He was one of the only two that went into the Promised Land out of the 600,000 men that left Egypt. Not even Moses and Aaron had that. But what we see here is God, at this mountain, making a covenant with his people. But God says, it will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, what that means is we're talking about the Sinai covenant here, Exodus chapter 19 and following. Why is it that there's a need for a new covenant? Well, the writer of the Hebrews chapter 8 explains this. Not the problem with the covenant. The problem was with the people because they didn't keep it. So here it says in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, 
because they violated my covenant, even though I, for my part, was a what? I was a husband to them. What is taking place in Exodus chapter 19 is a marriage. Remember today from the Hoth Torah, it says, I will betroth you. I will betroth you. I will betroth you. That's the covenant of marriage. God married Israel that day on the mountain. God gave us his Torah and we violated it. So God says, this is the covenant I'm going to make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Why in the world, if God is frustrated with the people violating the covenants, violating the Torah, why in the world is he with the new covenant going to put his Torah on our hearts and our minds? I have an answer for that. If he's angry because they violated the covenant... Maybe it's because he wants them to keep it. Maybe he wants his people to be obedient to what he says. You think? I know. Because that's the nature of the new covenant. God gives us not only his Torah, but he also gives us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is given to us not just for the spiritual gifts, the Holy Spirit is given to us so that we will keep God's commandments. He puts his Holy Spirit in us, as he says in the book of Ezekiel. He says in verse 26 of Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit inside of you. I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now listen to this. It has to do with this Shavuot 2,000 years ago. I will put my spirit inside of you, Acts chapter 2, <coughs> and cause you to live by my laws, respect my rulings, and obey them, Exodus chapter 19 and following. As I said last Shabbat, the giving of the law, and the Torah, and the giving of the Holy Spirit are one and the same. They're one and the same. Because God, according to uh, his word, is holy. God is righteous. God is just. God's word, according to even Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, is holy, is righteous, is just. That means his word is reflective of his holy nature. And it's his Holy Spirit. You know why he's called the Holy Spirit? Because he's going to empower us, according to Ezekiel, he's going to empower us to walk holy. You and I will fall short of that, always, in walking in the flesh. If we look at our lives, and we're being honest, if we look at our lives and we compare it with the Torah that we have been given, I can say, and I don't know about you, but I can definitely say, I am a sinner. I look at the perfect Torah, and I realize that I don't measure up to what the Torah says. Now, the brother of our Lord Yeshua, Yaakov, James, writes it in James chapter 1, verse 23. I'm going to go back just for a moment to verse 22. Ah, verse 21, why not? So, James 1, 21. Rid yourselves of all vulgarity and obvious evil, and receive meekly the word, listen to this, what did God say in the New Testament? He was going to do what? He was going to do what? He was going to put his Torah where? Inside of us, in our hearts, and write it on our minds, right? Listen to what James says. Receive meekly the word implanted in you. Torah is implanted in you if you are really his. If you are really a part of the New Testament, the new covenant, Torah is in you now. But what else is in you? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to give you the power to be able to walk a holy life if you yield to him. 
There's a dynamic that takes place that I'm not going to talk about today. In Romans chapter 7, there are two Torahs mentioned in Romans chapter 7 by Paul. There is one to- Torah, which is holy, righteous, and just, Romans 7, 12. And by the way, and then in verse number 14, the Torah is of the Spirit. But there's another Torah that Paul talks about, the law of sin and death. And he says that's written in the members of our body. So when we are going through a struggle as believers, it's the struggle of this law of sin and death, which we are wearing right now, and the law of God, which Paul admits he wants to do what is right. He wants to do what the Torah says. But then he finds himself doing just the opposite, the very evil that he didn't want to do. But here's how you know what sin is. John says sin is the transgression of the what? The Torah, or the law. So if you want to know what sin is, just look at the Torah and just do the opposite of it. So when the sin, or excuse me, when the Torah says thou shalt not, just do it. Thou shalt not murder. Okay, just do it. What are you doing? You're sinning. The Torah says thou shalt not steal. My goodness, you've got a lot of nice things over there. I want it. I'm going to take it. I'll just do it, right? You know what that is? That's sin. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbors. Just do it. If you do it, that's sin. So if you want to know what sin is, just look at what the Torah says and just do the opposite. Then you're sinning. But as believers, we shouldn't be doing that. Paul says, what then? Should we sin that grace may abound? Shall we keep sinning and sinning over it again so that the blood of Messiah and the grace of Messiah will just keep washing us, washing us, washing us? That's not what we're supposed to do. Paul would go ahead and say, heaven forbid. God does not want us to continue to rebel against his word. He wants us to be obedient. But he realizes this. All have, all of us, anyway, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh, none righteous. No, not one. None of us. My point being is the reason for the Holy Spirit is if you really want to walk a holy life, if you're halakha, your walking is going to be holy, you need the Holy Spirit to do it. And Torah, and by the way, the Holy Spirit caused the word to be written. If the Holy Spirit had any problem with any of this in the written word with us, he wouldn't have had it written. Because you go to Peter, and Peter says, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter would go ahead and say, uh, no, not 1, sorry. Let me find it really quick here. 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, verse 20, First of all, understand this. No prophecy of Scripture is to be interpreted by an individual on his own, for never has a prophesy come as a result of human will. On the contrary, people moved by the Holy Spirit spoke the message from God. Every single word here came through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Not a single word that we have, and I'm talking about the autographs, Not a single word in the autograph came as a result of human will. Not one. But men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit wrote what God wanted them to write. If the Holy Spirit is holy and he's going to empower us, as we saw in Ezekiel, to be walking holy, then what is our walk going to be in line with? That written word. Our walk, if we're really his... If we really have the Holy Spirit within us, our walk is going to be in line with the Torah. So if you start to wonder, am I walking according to the Torah? Well, look at what James says again. I <laughs> finally get around to it. Don't deceive yourselves, he says, by only hearing what the word says, but do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. Well, sometimes in the morning when I look at myself in the mirror, I want to forget what I look like. (laughs) I had my CPAP on all night. My hair is like this. That's why I'm keeping it cut short nowadays as best as I can. I should have visited somebody this week, but I didn't have time. 
But the thing is, if we look at ourselves in the mirror, and some of you look really nice, <laughs> as opposed to somebody else, I look at myself in the mirror, the thing I discover is this. I can walk away from that mirror and forget what I look like. I try to, sometimes. Now the thing I've noticed about women, and it doesn't matter which woman it is, what age it is, somehow or other, just before we get to a destination, the woman pulls down that mirror that's on the passenger side, looks at herself and primps herself a little bit and puts the mirror back up again. I don't understand it. I'm a man. I, I don't do that. <laughs> of course, no amount of primping is going to help me. <laughs> but the thing is, look at this. Verse 25, James says, But if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah... Which, by the way, is not bondage if you read Psalm 119 and David writing about it, which gives freedom. Now, in the church today, you're hearing a lot about, well, the Torah is bondage. You know, it's been done away with on the cross. I am so sorry to tell you, the Torah is not bondage, it is freedom. And it has not been done away with the, on the cross, otherwise, we don't know what holy or sin is. Because Paul in Romans 7 says, I wouldn't have even known what sin was unless I looked into the Torah. So Paul is saying the same thing James is saying. And what we have to do, since all this word was inspired by the Holy Spirit, we have to be looking at Torah and saying, is my life walk in line with what this word says? And if it's not then the problem is not this word. And the problem is not the Holy Spirit, because he's there if we're willing to lean on him. Because, hey, listen, it's the Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters that were part of the creation. He has all the power we need. It's up to us to seek it. And then we have to yield to him, because that's our problem. You know, we may hear the word as James is writing, but if we walk away from it and don't do anything about it, oh, I'm okay. You know, I don't do what this brother does. You see, we're comparing ourselves by the wrong standard by many accounts. I'm looking horizontally and I'm saying, well, my life isn't so bad. How many people are going to heaven from all sorts of different religions? Oh, my life is fine. But they're looking in the wrong direction because the direction to be looking at isn't horizontal. It's vertical. Um, one of these days I'll get to my message. But here we are. The same day of the year, Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Here there are two mountains, Sinai and Mount Moriah. Two complementary giftings, as I just elaborated on. The giving of the Torah and the giving of the Spirit. And then there's tongues at both events. You thought that was just a New Testament thing? No. It's in the Old Testament too. When God spoke from the mountain and people heard the voice and they thought it might have been just thunder or the sound of the shofar and stuff, they had spiritual ear problems. You know how many other people have spiritual ear problems? I'm not just deaf physically. I have spiritual ear problems and if we're all honest, we all have spiritual ear problems. We need to hear the word of God and we need to do it. Now, the thing about Shavuot or the Feast of Weeks is exactly seven weeks after Passover. It's known as 50, or the number Pentecost in the Septuagint. On the Jewish calendar, it's the only Moed or appointed time that's not given a specific day on a specific month because it occurs exactly 50 days after Passover, the day after Passover. That's why we count the Omer, so we can know when it is. So Passover occurs at different dates and different days of the week on the Gregorian solar calendar. And because of that, so can Shavuot occur on different days and different days of the week. But it has to still be 50 days after the first day of unleavened bread. Tonight at sundown, which probably isn't going to happen until roughly 9-ish, 8.30-ish, 9-ish. That's what it's going to actually be. And we're going to celebrate our Arab Shavuot service after we eat an odeg after this Sabbath. Traditionally, hopefully there's plenty of dairy foods there because the Torah represents the milk of the word. So we have dairy foods here, cheese, cheesecake, blintzes, ice cream. 
The reason for this, and a possible uh, explanation of that in Shir Hasharim, the Song of Songs, is in verse 4, uh, or chapter 4, verse 11, it says, the milk and honey are under your tongue. By the way, when a Jewish child gets old enough to start to say the Shema, the Shema is the first, uh, then the closest thing to a creed that Judaism has. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. When that happens, there's, ton there's honey put placed on the tongue of that little child. And the reason why is because the association of who God is is associated with sweetness, that they will remember it. Usually it's the first words that a child utters. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And oftentimes if the opportunity is presented, it's the last words that a Jewish person says before they die. Because then they have the bookends of their lives with hearing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Here we're celebrating the sweetness of freedom. That is, we left Egypt. We're headed to a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3, verses 8 through 17. So eating dairy on Shavuot commemorates the sweetness of freedom and the new life that lay before the Jewish people. So what we see here is our Lord Yeshua, for a total of 40 days <coughs> after his death and resurrection, appeared in Acts chapter 1 to his disciples for those days. And he says to them, don't depart from Jerusalem. Here's where the mountain is. The temple mount is in Jerusalem. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he you have heard me speak, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> so ten days after this came Shavuot. It's a very important time. And then in Acts chapter 2, which we've already read, the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, and the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. The only ones that were there, <coughs> that were coming, were Jews at this time, Jews and proselytes. When is the first non-proselyte, non-Jew brought in? He's not brought, he's not brought in. He's Cornelius until Acts chapter 10. And as we're going to be talking about in our church history thing, that isn't going to happen for another 8 to 11 years. You might think in reading from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 10 that a matter of months passed. No, we're talking about over a decade, roughly a decade, before the first non-Jew, non-convert, full convert I'm speaking about, came into the faith. So why are Jews and proselytes, full proselytes there? It's because it's one of the three pilgrimage feasts in the year. Known as the Shalosh Regalim. That is the three pilgrimage feast. Exodus 23, 14 through 17 says, Three times a year you're to celebrate a feast to me. The first one is unleavened bread. The second one is the feast of the harvest of first fruits of your labors. That is Shavuot. And then the last one is the feast of ingathering, which is Sukkot, which is tabernacles. Again, God says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Then you go to Exodus 34. You shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that's Shavuot, which we're in. Tonight, at sundown, the first fruits of your wheat harvest, the Feast of Ingathering, at the turn of the year. Three times all of the year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God. Three times they're to appear. Devarim, chapter 16, Deuteronomy 16, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in a place that he chooses. Now, it's really interesting because we now have a very important criteria. Uh, where is this pilgrimage feast leading? This feast, during the times of the temple, led to Jerusalem. That's where it leads. And where in Jerusalem it will be, is where the Lord chooses to establish his name, Deuteronomy 16, 11. Well, if you go to Jerusalem, you see that three valleys come together. The Hinnom Valley, that's the one on the far left. The Tyropian Valley, that's the one in the middle, where the Temple Mount is, Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac, where Yeshua was offered on the mountain as, his sac as a sacrifice. And then you've got the uh, Valley of Jehoshaphat, which is right next to the uh, 
Mount of Olives, also known as the Kidron Valley. The letter that is formed here by these three valleys converging is the Hebrew letter Shin. Shin. Just like when I do the blessing and closing, like the erotic benediction, this forms the letter Shin. If you remember Spock on Star Trek, he was raised, Leonard Nimoy was raised as an Orthodox Jew, and when the priest would bless the congregation, they would hold their hands up here with a sheen, with another sheen, which is a double blessing, which is the first letter of the Hebrew word Shaddai, for El Shaddai. So here God goes ahead and places his name on the hills and valleys of Jerusalem with the letter sheen to represent his name being placed there. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, it says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. The reason why they were there? Because they were commanded to in a biblical feast. Now I'll share with you that Pontius Pilate, during the time of our Lord Yeshua, didn't go to Jerusalem and didn't stay in Jerusalem any longer than he had to. Now he had to go up to Jerusalem during the feast of Passover. Because this is what is the first pilgrimage feast in the year, in which there are going to be thousands and thousands of Jews converging on Jerusalem from the entire known world of the time. One of the things that was happening when a whole lot of Jews got together under Roman dominion is that there were a few of them that were going to fight the Romans. Why Pilate was there so conveniently is he came up for the pilgrimage feast too. But for an altogether different reason. He went there to keep order. He brought troops up with him and he stayed up there. He stayed up there from the entire time because normally he lived in Caesarea which is named after Caesar which Herod, had a deep, Herod the Great had a friendship with built this little city on the coast. And he normally stayed there on the Mediterranean, where it was really, really nice for him. But he had to come up to Jerusalem during the Feast of uh, uh, Pesach to keep order. And he had to stay there for that entire 50 days because there are still thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the world there. And there were an element of them called the Zealots, for instance, the Zealotai, that were going to cause trouble for Rome. So it's amazing that since God wants all the nations to do this, that here you have a Roman uh, governor <laughs> doing that, not by exactly his choice, but because he had to. They were gathered there by biblical commandment. So they observed the timetable as the same timetable as the Pharisees did. Pharisees and Sadducees had a disagreement. Sadducees were in charge of the temple. However, the Pharisees were beloved of the people, and the Pharisees' timetable took precedent. The reason why they were there at the same time is because everybody followed after the Pharisaical calendar. Because if they followed after the, some followed after the Sadducees calendar, some followed after the Pharisees calendar, they might not gather on the same day. You see, different people have different calendars. The Canadians have a different Thanksgiving day than we do. So which Thanksgiving day do you celebrate? The one in Canada, the Canadian one, or the one here? You see, calendars can separate us. The Essenes had a different calendar. They thought the temple calendar was an abomination. They thought the temple was an abomination. So they never observed these feasts and festivals at the proper date. They had their own thing going. So my point being is the Pharisees were the leaders pretty much, and the timetable was that which fit which these Jewish people from all the nations were coming to on this pilgrimage feast. So they were there following the timetable of the Pharisees. They observed Pentecost, according to the calendar, on May 23rd, which was a Thursday at sunset till Friday, May 24th at sundown. Sunset to sunset. Now I want to tell you, because of the destruction of the temple in 70, most of the observances, particularly the sacrifices, are not done on Shavuot. There are things we do not do, but then there are things that are reminders of things we do do. Shavuot is known as Yom HaBikarim, the day of first fruits. 
But there's another Yom HaBikarim, folks, that happened 50 days earlier. They're sharing the same name, which I've taught on numerous times already. But if you go with me to Leviticus chapter 23, again looking at the Moedei Adonai, the days of the Lord, you're going to see that the first Moedei, the day of first fruits, is the one that's found in Leviticus 23, verse number 10, where it says, You are to bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the Kohen. He's to wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you will be accepted. The Kohen is to wave it on the day after the Shabbat, which would be the day after the first day of unleavened bread, which is a Shabbat. So that's a first fruit, but then you've also got this day, which is also a first fruit in giving your offerings unto the Lord. Look at verse 20 of Leviticus 23. The Kohen will wave them with the bread of the first fruit. So both of these days have the same name, but they're 50 days apart. Now that's a tie between Passover and Shavuot, which means that technically Passover is not even over with until we're at the mountain. Passover wasn't just simply getting us out of Egypt. Passover was getting a freed people out of Egypt to the mountain. We received Torah as a free people. We were not under bondage under Pharaoh. So the 50 days between the first first fruits, and by the way, Yeshua was the first fruits of the dead, is he not? Paul writes about that very clearly in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Yeshua fulfilled first fruits from the dead on the one that we see in Leviticus 23, verse number 10 and 11. 50 days later, now by the way, up to 40 days, he presented himself to the people. Did he not to his disciples, as we saw in Acts chapter 1? He said, remain here until that which I promised to you is going to come. That is the giving of the Holy Spirit. That's 10 days later. So 10 days later, he gives us his Holy Spirit. That's on this first fruits. So freedom from Egypt is not total until, and Passover is not total until we come to this feast. So we're looking at Exodus chapter 20, uh, 34. You shall celebrate the feast of weeks. That is the first fruits of the wheat, wheat harvest. And this is what God wanted us to do. He calls us to make a pilgrimage to the Beit HaMikdash. Beit means house. Hamikdash, that is that of the Kadesh, you see Kadesh, the root in Mikdash. Uh, so that's the temple as an offering of the Lord. And they offered the same prayer. You can read about it later, but in Deuteronomy 26, verses 3 to 10, whenever they came to present their first fruits, they said this prayer. I don't have enough time to, uh, to progress through that. Here then, God brings us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, brings us to this place, and he gives us not only redemption, but he gives us the Torah. Every, every Passover, we sing a song called Dayani. Ilu hotzi hotzi anu, hotzi anu mi mitzrayim, hotzi anu mi mitzrayim. Good. Dayani, dai, dayani, dai, dayani, dai. It would have been sufficient. So, Dianu, it would have been sufficient. Would have it been sufficient just to get us out of Egypt? Okay. Would have been sufficient to get us through the waters? Yes. But you know he gives us so much more. He gets us to the mountain. He gives us his Torah to give us freedom. Then later, 1,500 years, he gives us his Holy Spirit to give us freedom. Not from the Torah but the freedom to live a holy life. Which, by the way, brings you uh, comfort. Which brings you joy, because the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, God has better things in mind for us if we just hear and do. That's what it's all about. So God gives the commandment to Israel that the sign that I have been with you and I've sent you. 
is when you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this mountain. Sinai, by the way, is not in the southern part of the Sinaic Peninsula. Sinai is over across the sea. And that is where Moses, his father-in-law, lived, Jethro. And that is where we will one day, uh, maybe, if the uh, Saudi Arabians allow us to, because <laughs> that's where it is, in Arabia. Maybe we will be able to visit one day. But I suspect that's probably going to happen during the Messianic reign when he's in charge. So in the third month, as we read in Exodus 19, that's when we were gathered at Sinai. The thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, the fire, everything in front of the mountain. And what this is, is a remembrance that we left Egypt as slaves. We were freed. And God brings us to the mountain in 50 days. And we're to count these 50 days from the day after the first day of unleavened bread to this night tonight. And here we count for the entire uh, seven weeks and 50 days. I'm not going to get into that. So the connection is, <coughs> it is a link between Passover and Shavuot, the counting, that ties us from the first first fruit to the first fruit on the mountain. We are given the Torah on Shavuot. It reminds us of keeping or receiving the law. We see that in Exodus 19, 1 and 2, Exodus 20, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, and also found within Exodus 21, chapter 21 to 23, they're known as the Mishpatim, or the rulings. Uh, I've talked about that before, but we don't have time today to go through it. Now, it's a very important thing for you to understand this. The Torah is not, or let me put it this way, Yeshua is not against the Torah. Yeshua is the one who gave us the Torah on Sinai. Mm -hmm. Now, I know we have discussions about that. There's no time to get into that today because I'm already over time. It says in Exodus 24 that the elders, when Moses and the elders went up, that they saw God. There, there was the institution of the covenant, and there was also the covenant meal because they ate there on the mountain in front of God. And it says they saw God on the mountain. It wasn't the Father. In John 1.18, Yeshua said, No one has seen God at any time. John 5.37, You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. John 6.46, Not that anyone has seen the Father. So you can't say that it was... God the Father, or God the Holy Spirit, necessarily, that gave Torah on the mountain. There was only one of the theophany, the appearances of God. There was only one that ever appeared in human form. I will share with you, I believe, that Melchizedek, who met Abraham after the battle of the five kings, was our Lord Yeshua, pre-incarnate. I submit that Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel after crossing the Yabak River on his way to meet his brother Esau, he wrestled with the pre-incarnate Yeshua. I submit to you that on the mountain of Sinai, when it says they saw God, that's Yeshua. <clears throat> when he is the only person of the triune God, who appeared as a theophany in the Tanakh. But he's also the one who redeemed his people. So the very one who gave us his Torah redeems us, not from the Torah, but from the sin coming as a result of our disobedience to the Torah. You see, God punishes us for our sins and our rebellion. But if you're a believer in our Lord Yeshua, he took that upon himself as the punishment. So when we look at who gave the Torah and who redeems us from the consequences of our breaking the Torah, he's one and the same. He's our Lord Yeshua. And what we need to realize is Yeshua is not against the Torah. The Torah didn't go to the cross. 
If you go to Paul, and we'll have to deal with that at a later time, Paul says that was written over the, uh, the cross. And what Pilate had written was that Yeshua violated not a religious law. It says Yeshua Hamelech, the king, Hayed Kudim, the Jews. He wrote it in the three languages, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. What was on the cross? The accusation that was against the law of Rome. How Yeshua violated the law of Rome. And the Romans made an example of him. You see, people were crucified on a hill far away where it was hard for people to crawl up that mountain to see what in the world did Pilate write up there? They didn't have binoculars at the time. Where people were crucified were as close to the roadway as possible so that when people passing by sees that poor guy hanging there and they wonder what was he crucified for, those who did have something written on the top of their cross was the accusation of the breaking of the law of Rome. There was not a religious significance at all to this. It was totally political. And even as Pilate said to the priests and stuff, I can't execute him for one of your religious laws, so blasphemy, I can't do anything about that. But he sure could about somebody who claimed himself to be king of the Jews when Caesar didn't appoint him. You see? The accusation that we should have above our cross is how every single one of these commandments that God commanded us to do, we violated. And that's what went to the cross against those ordinances that were written against us that we violated. You know, when a cop stops you, and I've been blessed, I've been stopped, but I've never been given a ticket in my entire driving life. I'm 64 now. That's not bad. I'm not saying that I didn't deserve a ticket. I have been stopped before by the Washington State Patrol once, coming from Spokane up to Priest River. And, you know, the cop isn't always, the police officer isn't always so gracious. But here's what he did. He pulled me over, he came up, he got my driver's license, he, uh, the insurance papers and stuff, he went back to his uh, vehicle and sat there for what felt like a couple hours. I want to get home, I want to get home. But anyway, he came back to the vehicle and said, you know, Mr. Booker, you have a perfect driving record. And he said, I want to keep it that way. He hands me my driver's license and the insurance paper, and he said, slow down. The thing is, Caesar doesn't have to be so nice. Does it? And you never get rewarded for all the good driving you do. Have you ever been pulled over and the cop said to you, I like the way you drive. You're perfect. <laughs> Well, if the cop pulled me over, I'm almost peeing my pants right then. <laughs> it's that bad. Oh, no, 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 what's going to happen to me? I know that sounds a little gross. But, but the thing is, cops don't usually stop you to tell you how good you're drooling. When you're getting stopped, it's usually because you violated the law. That's the same thing here. Being obedient and being good doesn't necessarily give us a reward, but you know something? In the case of God, he says to us, if we're at the end of our lives and we've been obedient, we've heard and we've done, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You want to talk about words that I want to hear? Those are the words I want to hear. Not how bad I've right been. That's why our Lord Yeshua took my violation upon himself. Well, we're going to go ahead and close. Torah was given to us on the mountain as a redeemed people. We, he didn't take us from slavery in Egypt to slavery to him. And if you happen to think that if you keep every letter, and I know Messianics, excuse me, I know Orthodox Jews and I know Messianics that really get judgmental upon everybody and everything, that go ahead and look down their noses, well, you're not doing this, my brother. Or you're not doing this commandment, you're not doing it right. I look back and I say to myself, are you? 
Because, you know, as obedient as you think you are, you're still violating something. Because ain't nobody good enough to walk on water except for one. <laughs> he came to deliver us from the consequences of our violating his commandments. We deserve eternal damnation. We deserve eternal hell. We deserve eternal fire. But he saved us with his own blood. And if the question comes down to how much did he love us, he loved us that much. You see, he was willing to take upon himself the punishment that we deserve because of his love for us. For God to love the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he blesses us by making us his already redeemed people. Obedience to Torah is not a condition for redemption. That's what the whole issue of the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council was all about. How is it that Gentiles are saved? We talked about this last week. How is it? Faith. Faith. And Peter says and reminds us, how is it that Jews are saved? <laughs> Not circumcision or keeping the Torah of Moses. <laughs> They're saved by the same criteria. It's only faith and faith alone. Torah does not redeem anybody. You could keep as much Torah as you want. And I'm not saying don't try, don't care. You're just not going to get redeemed by it. You're not going to find heaven by it. You will find a lot of people who may be more orthodox and more obedient than you. But your salvation is not dependent upon your obedience to Torah. Now, evidence that you are saved, on the other hand, is definitely clearly representative of whether or not you keep Torah. So you better ask yourself, if you're not looking at the perfect Torah and finding something changing more and more into the image of the Son, our Lord Yeshua, then there is something wrong with your walk, and you better ask yourself, am I really a believer in him? You see, Torah doesn't redeem us, but it already tells us if we are redeemed or not. It's given to us as a redeemed people, and as a redeemed people, we should be keeping it out of love and gratitude for what he has done for us. Why should I want to keep it? Well, if not for the sake of walking like he walked, you see, we had to keep the Torah perfectly, guys. If he didn't keep the, perf uh, the Torah perfectly, then it means that he sinned. Because sin is the transgression of the Torah. So if he didn't keep Torah perfectly, he sinned, and he cannot be our kinsman redeemer, and he cannot redeem us. And folks, if he even violated even the smallest commandment of Torah, and he sinned, then we're still lost in our sins. That is not a good place to be. Because then we're going to find ourselves in that hot, warm spot, and it's hot and warm in here right now. <laughs> Probably because of all the hot air that's emanating from the front, maybe. <laughs> you see, the problem is we. We didn't keep his Torah. But Torah is a blessing for us. But what the law, what the Torah cannot do, weak as it was through the flesh, and that's the reason why I don't keep it. Romans 8.3. God did, because God gave us his Holy Spirit, because the Torah is spiritual. The Torah is good. But in my flesh, nothing is good. Romans 7, we see the battle between the two Torahs. We recognize that what we're wearing right now wants to fight against God's Torah. But the Torah is spiritual, and it's meant to be kept in the Spirit. It cannot be kept by observing the letter of the law. So, 1,500 years after Sinai, on the same day of the year, the Holy Spirit was given. Those who were his received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as promised to us, the Comforter, was sent to us in Acts chapter 2, as promised in John 16. And now, we who are believers 
are being empowered to keep the Torah through the power of the Spirit. I think I'm having to finish. Here we go. I want to just close on this note. If you are of him, if the Holy Spirit makes his dwelling inside of your body, then your mind is changed. Your mind is different. The old part of you is being crucified, as Paul talks about in Romans 6, and your mind is changing. Your mind is not hostile toward God and his commandments. It's subject to the commandments or the law of God. It's able to be subjected to God's law. And we're wanting to be pleasers of God. If we are his, this is what we should want to be. This is how we should think, as opposed to the way we used to be. We used to be hostile toward God. We used to be against his Torah. We used to be able to say, I don't care what God says, and I've run into people like that. I don't care what God says in Leviticus chapter 23. Here God puts all his Moedah, his holy days, out for us. And then there's Christmas and Easter, which are no, nowhere mentioned in Leviticus 23 or, or anywhere else in Scripture. I don't care what God says in his word. I'm going to do this anyway. You probably all have heard this at one time or another. But the problem is that's the way you used to be, and that's the way carnal believers are. But if we're walking by the Spirit... We must be the exact opposite. We must not be hostile. If God says something, we need to do it. We need to be subject to his law. We need to be subjected to God's law. If he says this is what it is, then we need to be obedient because that's a step of walking in holiness. And we are called to be a holy people. We are called to be pleasers of God. Paul says, I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. What God says pleases him as they hear my word and they do it. They walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances and do them. God wants us not to be hearers of the word, but to be doers and to do that. We need his Holy Spirit to empower us to walk that. So we're coming up onto the Shavuot uh, Sabbath right now. Sundown, it'll happen. It's going to be something we need to observe because God commands it. So today, we're going to close right now this part of the service with the Kiddush blessing of the fruit of the vine.